Mother's Day is an emotionally dense day set right in the middle of an emotionally dense time. The time of sheltering in place, the time when we are living pandemic. Sometimes it just helps to name the reality of what is. Mother's Day is a day of deep delight and wonder. After all, because mothers are, we are each one of us alive on this day. It is such an astounding gift. And Mother's Day can also be, though, a time for grieving. There are some of us who long to be able to call our mother on this day or know that she breathes somewhere on this earth, and we are not able to do that on this Mother's Day. Two, Mother's Day is a day when we experience, some of us, the, the, uh, the challenge of being in a culture which makes mothering such an important part of being a woman. And there are women who choose not to be mothers. And there are women who have not been able to be mothers, biological mothers. So it is an emotionally dense day we celebrate on this day. Many of us also on this day are spending Mother's Day in a way we never have before. There are not children's choirs singing in church this Mother's Day. There are not tables surrounded by children or family or offspring of any kind or friends. Uh, we aren't able to get together to feast and to celebrate and to laugh and delight in each other's company. There is no, well, there's so much that there is not on this Mother's Day. So our hearts are feeling all kinds of feels on this Mother's Day, at least mine is as a mother. So into that emotional royal, I feel so blessed to share with you a scripture passage that was written to a community that was feeling a desperate need for hope and a desperate need for reassurance. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10 is a weaving of Hebrew Bible scriptures through which the people of Jesus hear the teachings of Jesus and are reminded that the way of Jesus is meant to remind us that hope is eternal and always, and there is nothing that can separate us from the power of God's generative love. So the text is also preached often at ordination services, services where clergy are empowered and blessed and laid hands on and reminded that they are a part of a line of people who have been called throughout time to proclaim the goodness of God's grace. It's an ordination text. And as I thought about that, that reality on this day, what I, was what I was sort of laughing to myself about is this. Um, over the last two months, you have learned that you are many more things than you ever thought you were. So parents have become primary teachers, primary teachers of their children, not primary school teachers, although it could be that case. Um, People who are uh, healthcare professionals and truck drivers are heroes in our culture. Um, so many of us are learning uh, what it is to do things we never thought that we were called to do. And what I'm telling you on this day is you are called to be a royal priesthood. You're called to be priests, pastors, proclaimers of the goodness, the delicious power of God. So uh, as I read this text to you, I want you to know that you are called as God's beloved and you are called as holy and you are called as a part of a royal priesthood. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Thank God, that's just the way it is. So hear these words from 1 Peter. So clean house. Make a clean sweep of malice and pretense, envy and hurtful talk. You've had a taste of God. Now, like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness. 
then you will grow up mature and whole in God. Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out, but God set that stone, Jesus Christ, in a place of honor. So present yourselves as building stones for construction of a sanctuary, vibrant with life, in which you will serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives to God. The scriptures provide precedent. Look, I'm setting up a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, Jesus is a stone to be proud of. But to those who refuse to trust him, the stone that the workmen threw out is now the chief foundation stone. For the untrusting, it is a stone to trip over, a boulder blocking the way. They trip and they fall because they refuse to obey, just as predicted. But you are ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and to speak out for God, to tell others of the night and day difference God has made from you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. May God add a blessing to the power of this word. The thing that's sort of, well, among other things, keeping me uh, grounded these days is the power of story. It seems I don't have a whole lot of capacity for deep study or uh, a lot of other things that have come naturally to me. And what is feeding me with the pure milk of grace are stories. And so I would like to share with you on this day a story that comes from the heart and the wisdom and the wit of Anne Lamott, uh, who is one of my favorite theologians. She's written a book called Plan B. And the story that she tells is found in that, in that book. So she attends a scruffy church in San Francisco and a woman in her church, whose name is also Anne, so this can be confusing, but we'll get through this together, is an ardent activist. She's wildly passionate about justice. And according to Lamont, this woman sometimes sounds like a mad Old Testament prophet beseeching her church, her church to tend to the starving people of the world, to save the rainforest, to do any number of things to save this earth. She made some people nervous, this woman did. People with passion often, often do with her political passion. And she also made people nervous because she only had one hand. And when she was getting emphatic about her views, she would wave her stump through the air for emphasis. She was, Anne Lamont says, like your craziest aunt, the religious one with the wild eyes. She fell prey, did this woman, to a recurrence of cancer. And she shared her pain and her struggle with her church during times of worship, but she always shared with them the message that God loved the world, all evidence to the contrary, and that we must not give up on God. So Lamotte, knowing that she had a stunning teacher in the midst of community, asked Anne to go to her Sunday school class and share a little bit about her faith and what it is that kept her so firmly grounded in the midst of so much in the world. And as Anne sat with them, she asked them, these children who were um, five years old to age 12, in the Sunday school class. She chatted with them a little bit and then she asked them if they noticed anything different about her. And they finally got over their very careful politeness and they mentioned her stump. And she also let them examine that stump up close. Well, the kids studied it 
with fearless attention. And Anne told them how it is that her mom was a military chemist who found her daughter's one-handed state disgusting. She told them how lonely she had been as a child growing up. She told them that the deal that she made was that if she shared her mother's bad opinion of her, she got to be in relationship with her mother. Otherwise, she was totally alone. Until, she told the children, one day, Jesus came into the great emptiness. It happened when she was six or so. She was sitting on her rocking chair in her bedroom when she suddenly noticed in her stump a baby's face in the scar tissue that was left there. It looked, she said, like a doll, she told the children. And so what she saw was the features looked up at her very, very gently. It was me, she told the children. And so she swaddled that baby, that face, that gently looking at her with love face. She swaddled it with a scarf and she told the children this. She said, it was me. Both children were me. The six-year-old who was doing the smothering and the mothering and the baby were both me. And I felt Jesus looking up at me from inside that baby's face. And he was saying, I'm sorry it turned out this way, but you, you are whole in my eyes. So she told the children, I got me back. And in Jesus, I found a real mother. She went on. Having this paw made me notice how much suffering there is in the world. It makes me ask, what is this suffering about? What's the answer? The suffering itself means nothing, but the answer is that I can't look away from that suffering. I saw that God wanted me to help relieve the suffering and that work has given me peace. She died a few months later, Anne Lamont says. And festooning her coffin were pictures drawn by the children that she had shared her faith life with. Her coffin, Anne Lamont says, looked like a gift box. And it was. Thanks be to God.